I wanted to ask you, I know slush pool was started in the Czech Republic. Is mining still viable there or are electricity costs too expensive now to, to permit mining? Mining is viable if you do it uh, as a kind of DCA kind of stuff. Like if you don't really care about uh, the operating profit right now. So this way you can mine basically everywhere in the world. It's a non-KYC DCA kind of thing. Uh, but if you are mining for uh, operating profit, uh, there are pro- probably better countries to mine in than Czech Republic. But there are exceptions. Um, if you have like solar panels, if you can find a way to uh, use uh, a cheap natural gas, which is not the case right now because natural gas has been skyrocketing. Um, there are edge cases where you can still make mining profitable even in Czech Republic, uh, but I'm not uh, really focused on mining myself. And uh, maybe to clarify, Slush Pool was founded by Slush, by uh, the founder of Soto Shops as well, but it's been operated and owned uh, by Brains System, which is a separate company now. Um, so I have a question. Um, you, I remember you did mention that um, you were into Bitcoin before you got distracted and, you know, deviated into other, you know, altcoins, then went back to Bitcoin. And you also mentioned that, you know, Satoshi Labs Trezor is a Bitcoin first company. What I wanted to ask is, you know, I, I see that, you know, Bitcoin first and Bitcoin centric are two different things. Now, when you consider that um, uh, Trezor does also support, you know, all coins for many other Bitcoin maximalists, they would, you know, consider them as shit coins, you know. How would you, you know, um, how would you, you know, reconcile these two, you know, parallels, like, you know, these are two opposite sides, if depending on which perspective you're coming from. How, if, if I can understand being a Bitcoin first, you know, company, but not Bitcoin centric, so what is Satoshi Labs, you know, how does Satoshi Labs view Bitcoin and all coins? How do they merge these, you know, these two worlds into these two different ideologies into one? And as a company, how does that, how do you, how do you operate basically in that regard? So uh, the features that are on our roadmap uh, are all revolving around Bitcoin, like CoinJoin, child pays for parent, full node support, coin control, uh, and such. And uh, we also release uh, Trezor-only firmware, uh, Bitcoin-only firmware. So if uh, people like me, for example, are interested in keeping only Bitcoin in their Trezor, uh, that's not a problem. And you don't have to uh, encounter any uh, altcoins uh, on your experience with the Trezor suite. And uh, when it comes to like uh, adding some altcoin features or altcoin support. This is done by the respective communities of these altcoins. We uh, basically uh, say what the requirements are for their pull requests on GitHub. They have to do it themselves. Then we just check if everything is all right, if this will be safe for the users, and then we merge it uh, into you know Trezor Suite. But uh, we like some uh, like Bitcoin only manufacturers say we can lose some kind of focus on Bitcoin if we have altcoin support as well. But this is not the case because the work is being done by the altcoin communities. If they are interested in adding some features or having an altcoin support, we provide them with uh, the environment because everything is open source. Uh, we uh, give them guidelines on what they should uh, fulfill in order to make it safe and they have to do their own work. And actually uh, with some altcoins, what uh, happened at least once was uh, they kind of broke uh, the compatibility and we had to basically uh, see supporting uh, and I just forgot what kind of altcoin it was, but this has happened. If the community doesn't uh, provide this kind of support uh, for the users, then they don't. They won't have uh, the support in the Trezor Suite. I feel like also, uh, as someone who's very much like pro people being able to decide what they want to do, kind of thing, uh, and also someone, I guess you're wary that you've got uh, a big competitor in Ledger. 
Um, it, I feel like if you if if you went to being Bitcoin only rather than Bitcoin first, you're going to run that issue that um, that suddenly there's a load of people who are not even going to consider your product, right? I guess is is another concern. Like because um, there's another thing as well to consider. Like um, as you said before, you you got into Bitcoin first, then you spent an, a period of time being interested in, alt- in altcoins. And what if that was the period that you decided to buy your hardware wallet? And if if Trezor didn't accept any altcoins whatsoever. You would never have picked one up. Uh, there was a Trezor. You would have gone for Ledger, for example. And then by the time you're back to being Bitcoin only, you're like, oh, well, I've got my Ledger. It works fine. And then now you're not going to be a Trezor customer. So I suppose there is that element of needing to compete maybe as well. That, that means you can't be Bitcoin only. Um, I, would that be fair to say? Or uh, that, that that surely must have, I would have thought, gone through the mind of yourselves. Yeah, that. well, um, that was uh, part of the case in 2017 when... Uh, People were shitcoining a lot, and uh, you had a trouble with like Segwit, Bitcoin Cash, hard forking, and such. And uh, like Bitcoin maximalism was very uh, like was quite kind of niche back then. Uh, I respect highly everyone who saw it back then, even. Uh, but it wasn't as widespread as it is today. So uh, yeah, that was that's a part of the story that in order to survive, basically 2017, you sort of had to support altcoins. But uh, uh, like to comment on today, uh, we are not necessarily in the position to educate people about like their investment choices, let's say. And there are a lot of people that maybe. Uh, are lured in through NFTs or DeFi or some kind of new hype. And gradually they will see that Bitcoin is the one thing that stays over the years and that uh, doesn't uh, bankrupt them basically. So uh, uh, it's not set in stone. Like somebody can be 100% Ethereum or Solana or Cardano or something. And once they get burned, as the next bear market comes, they will probably switch to Bitcoin. And we want to be there for them. And uh, even if they choose like 100% Ethereum and some uh, NFTs and such, uh, these people still deserve to have uh, the best in class security, which uh, I don't believe the hardware wallets that are not fully open source provide. As far as like, hedge funds and investment firms and stuff like that go, are they using Trezor or do you see them using more like uh, custodial services? Well, uh, I definitely know, for example, Unchained Capital is using Trezor as part of their uh, multisig uh, scheme. Uh, And um, I probably cannot name any other names. Unchained Capital is well known in this regard. Uh, but yeah, like hedge funds usually use either professional custodial services like BitGo uh, or they use like assisted multisig uh, scheme like Unchained Capital provides or if they choose to uh, hold their own, their own, they are going for uh, Trezor or some kind of other hardware wallet. Uh, but yeah, like these people are well educated in how to safe keep it and Trezor is uh, part of the solution. Now in uh, in the in Bitcoin, what is the most interesting t- thing for you now in uh, in the Bitcoin space? What do you find most intriguing right now, and what are you looking forward to? Yeah, it's probably uh, Lightning Network. Everything about Lightning Network, uh, how uh, the capacity exploded this year. It's totally amazing how uh, the experience with Lightning Network improved. Uh, so yeah, everything about that. Uh, I'm very curious how the situation in El Salvador plays out over the coming months. Uh, Very curious if some other countries follow in their steps. Uh, Doesn't necessarily have to be as to to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender, but to just uh, make the environment uh, less uh, less hostile, let's say. And yeah, also kind of... um, curious about Taproot. Uh, it should be activated, I believe, in November. Uh, and curious what kind of new use cases we will see there with Taproot. You mentioned El Salvador, and I, I read your um, recent article on the state and Bitcoin bans. 
uh one of the key examples i took from that was um i guess like, you, you're writing a style where I, I i assumed you were kind of concerned i suppose about the united states trying to push bitcoin innovation to fit within this kind of this uh this box that they've they've drawn for, for crypto and for bitcoin um and, and and obviously we can see like lightning on on twitter and, and and as you said el salvador and the way that lightning and bitcoin has taken off there um what would you say is like your your biggest fear i suppose for the coming years like do you have any concerns for example about like um like the centralized uses for bitcoin and lightning like i've seen some people concerned for example about twitter and, and lightning and how it's kind of not this ideal use yeah. of Bitcoin, or, or, or I guess if you just got more excitement for the future kind of thing. Well, my biggest uh, concern is that people will buy and keep their Bitcoin on an exchange, like on some major one, like Kraken or, or Coinbase. And uh, you never know how this is going to play out. The government could start uh, taxing such a, uh, such, uh, uh, balances or it could uh, straight away confiscate it like happened with gold in 1933. Uh, it doesn't have to happen in the US but it can happen in other, other countries. I'm not very happy about Chivo wallet being custodial and, and being totally centralized. Uh, good questions are being asked about Chivo in terms of who owns the keys if there are actually any like if there are actually sufficient reserves of bitcoin backing up the balances so yeah uh, custodial bitcoin this is the biggest concern for people to just uh, be happy with uh, sort of buying into bitcoin maybe doing some dca uh, understanding why bitcoin matters but not doing the most important step taking possession of their coins and keep, keeping them in trezor uh, because you don't own any Bitcoin if you hold it on some centralized exchange. That, that's true. I mean, I, I guess I, I, uh, like my thoughts on custody of Bitcoin is such a like a up and down because <laughs> I kind of, I kind of, like I, I get it right. Like I get from perspective that if I'm talking to someone who has no idea about about Bitcoin at all. Um, I can understand how to them. Like, you know, say you talk to someone who's always kept their money in their bank, they don't necessarily even understand how the pound or the dollar or the euro even works. Uh, and they've just kind of spent, they earn their salary and that's it kind of thing. They've never had to worry about it really. Um, for someone like that, they may not trust themselves as, as, as crazy as it is or as ironic as it is to look after their own money. Um, uh, or they may just be elderly and, and be concerned about their own memory, for example. Um, so I guess it's like custody to me feels like something that is inevitably required at, like, at least for now to to bring people in teach them and then they make that next step once they feel like they understand it enough uh i don't know if you agree or disagree like would you how would you how would you sort of feel like we could remove the need for a custodial services or or do you think it's even worth removing the need for custodial services because i guess you mentioned custody is like a concern of yours which is fair i just wonder how far that goes like do you do you really worry about it as a 100 percent being around thing or or what's your kind of balance i guess yeah, I believe it uh, boils down to uh, usability, to UX. And uh, like three pillars in what we do at Satoshi Labs is basically security, privacy, and usability. Uh, like if you are super secure uh, and super private, but it's uh, hard for users to uh, work with your tools, they are not going to do it and they are going to hold their Bitcoin on Coinbase or something. So uh, this is a big part, big uh, like part of uh, why we uh, developed Trezor Suite as a standalone, standalone application for interacting with Trezor. Uh, because like a big part of it is uh, the onboarding process where we explain what you should do uh, what kind of prompts uh, you should follow on your device, never to uh, type your seed into some web page and such, uh, how to securely store your seed. And I guess it could be sort of intimidating for total newcomers, but uh, I believe we are doing a very good job now in explaining 
why it actually matters to take the time to uh, understand, write down your seed, secure it uh, safely, uh, come up with some passphrase and such. And uh, it's like when people started to learn how to work with internet, how to send their first emails, how to work with internet banking, it was always intimidating uh, at first, but as these new technologies became part of society, uh, people adjusted and it became part of everyday life. And I believe uh, this is going to happen with Bitcoin self-custody as well. Uh, the UX is the biggest concern here. And yeah, uh, like stuff like Coinbase uh, is probably easier for people to use uh, up till recently, but I believe with uh, tools like uh, Trezor Suite, it's uh, sort of on par and it's becoming uh, uh, an okay experience for people to get on board it with their own Trezor and uh, just understand what they are doing. Okay.